Hey friends and family, hey loved ones, hey fools, magicians and gardeners, loves. Yeah, how are you doing today? So I have been following some threads and excavating, excavating deeply the last couple months and, and beyond. And yeah, looking at my fears, looking at my desires, looking at my agendas, looking at my survival strategies and the things that I was like unwilling or unable to let go of. So I've been practicing letting go and being with the flow, <laughs> being in the flow and making peace with the unknown, embracing the unknown, and letting go. So just in my ways of being and as best I'm able to, like becoming aware of certain thoughts or emotions or yeah, feelings that carry me away and then yeah certain um, just habits or attachments or addictions or substitutions <laughs> substitutions for my well-being's needs like I'll find myself like yeah on autopilot <laughs> sometimes and then realize <laughs> oh I'm choosing this <laughs> you know and so just paying attention so yeah looking at attention looking at intentions and um, also like trust and surrender and responsibility and receiving all of me and valuing all I am and being love for me. And so just letting me be, being curious, staying open, um, choosing to be receptive to what love is offering me, to the gifts that are available right here for me and letting the rest be or fall away. And yeah, or just letting it be what it is, really. Like, yeah, being all that it is. Even if it's something that I don't really like, like it can exist. And if I need to, like, yeah, make an adjustment of some kind or set a boundary or just um, acknowledge how I feel about it. And yeah, then that's right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> wanted to show you guys some fun things that I've been doing or choosing. And uh, there's a painting behind me. It's the mirror that I did a couple few days ago. It's completely dry now. I don't know if you'll be able to see it very well with this camera. This camera isn't the best and everything, but I have some exciting news that I'll, I'll have a new setup soon. Um, my, my husband bought me a webcam and, a, and I have a nice microphone and I'll be doing some more like some a different kind of series video series soon um, with my new yeah setup and so um, for now though I'll just show you as best you're able to see for now like this painting behind me and I'll let <laughs> yeah. I'll just like bring this down a little bit this is my little meditation corner yeah so I really kind of like how that turned out. It looks like a pool of some kind. And I like the, the four corners and then the, the center, the, the five, the fifth, the quintessence in the middle. Kind of like that. And yeah, so it's like almost like a, in certain ways, can't really see like the patterns on this probably, but it is like, it's like a micro macro almost to me. And it just looks like portals and like, yeah, it's symbolic of like that stability and then in the center. Yeah. So this is fun fun for me to do. And I have a couple other like little paintings that I've done and I don't know if you'll how well you'll be able to see them, but it was what I shared about like my last couple times. I was going downstairs just to play and have fun. I don't know how good can't really see like how awesome like some of the colors are and the glitter uh, paint on there <laughs> super fun to do this one I really like the colors and how it felt so, turquoise and purples green and magenta and there's another one with the same kind of colors That one was fun. Like 
really like fluid. <laughs> yeah, I like it. It's like almost like a yeah, optical illusions in certain ways. It's, like, it's kind of fun. Fun stuff. And then this one is a work in progress. And I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it just gets to be what it is. <laughs> it's just like, I kind of got a wild hair and then it's just like, I don't know why, but yeah, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> so that's what I've just got to try. And so it's a work in progress and we'll see what it actually becomes. <laughs> but right now I kind of dig it. And all of those actually look amazing. Like the, um, this one behind me and a couple that I just showed you. They look amazing under the black light and they just like pop. It's such a cool thing to see like things transform like within a different spectrum of light, you know. And so, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Like how we actually see things like through that bending of the light and <laughs> yeah, it's kind of trippy. Like, yeah, just thinking about all those things, like how they relate on so many different levels and um, multi-dimensionally like yeah I just trip out all the time <laughs> like with different things like I was talking about um, the projection TV that this mirror behind me came from like and just thinking like yeah how like those things happen and they can like kind of um, present to us like how certain things work like yeah we kind of look at like some of the technology that we have nowadays like and then like apply it to like the esoteric wisdom in other ways like the mirror is like a really great <laughs> symbol for that and to understand like how that projection works and how like um how like the the function of sight actually works and how like um, our brain takes like that image and inverts it and then rearranges it in certain ways so it's like, yeah, sometimes it's like, yeah, that's why the beauty is in the eye of the beholder as well, too. It's because we have our preconceived notions and ideals and labels of what that is sometimes. And yeah, it's just kind of funny to think about like all those things that we actually take in um, sometimes consciously and sometimes mostly unconsciously, like, like all of the information that we are receiving through the light. Yeah, how conscious are we of what we're receiving? You know, so it's kind of funny in those ways to think about, or to, yeah, just to contemplate, or just like to, I just enjoy like philosophizing, I think. But, and that's the overthinker, the thinker, and the philosopher, and the sage that's been coming up a lot. And it has been funny uh, because I've been watching myself, bringing in the watcher, the witness and just laughing at myself because <laughs> I really do like it's just one of those things like almost like a guilty pleasure that I like to do I just like to think about things like and ponder but um it makes me freaking really like laugh my ass off like, at myself when yeah when certain things like when I'm going around on the hamster wheel and it's just like stepping back from that and then just like oh that is so cute like I'm so freaking adorable <laughs> like oh look at you I'm <laughs> trying to figure it all out you know and it is fun um because I had shared something in my last video I think about um, the mind by Yogi Bhajan and I had opened to chapter three and was reading about um, he was saying something about a wise man doesn't ask questions or something like yeah and I was like hmm I kind of I need to look into that a little bit more <laughs> I need to look into that a little bit more but yeah I feel like sometimes yeah we totally have different ways of interpreting different things um, yeah depending on like what our core beliefs are or what our agendas or our strategies or yeah unconscious like unconscious reactions to stimuli like and and to others yeah like if we could become more aware and more present I think yeah <laughs> that would be pretty interesting like just to watch ourselves and to just just to to see our own process or look into our own process or excavate um, 
Yeah, just follow different threads and things to understand like what our drives are <laughs> or our motives or our agendas because sometimes we're unaware of what those are. Like we think that we want like peace but actually what we're choosing sometimes is like that pride and um, that righteousness and that defensiveness or that self-righteous indignation, you know? And it's just kind of funny, yeah, like looking at those things, looking at all those things. And um, yeah, continuity. So excavating, <laughs> excavating and separating the wheat from the chaff. <laughs> And so that's funny because I just wanted to show you guys this like this little popcorn maker lid that I was talking about. I poured paint through it onto my little mirror back here. And so it's just like kind of like goes along with the themes of like, yeah, this, this will say this was a popcorn maker lid. Yeah. But what else could it be? Like what other uses? Yeah there possibly be just like that kind of a simple thing like looking at things like through the eyes of a child like I wonder I wonder what else this could be and like um, just kind of opening to a wider perspective for other possibilities you know so it reminds me of the sieve though and that keeps coming up like the archetypal sieve <laughs> and so in, in many different ways so I just wanted to share a couple of those fun things and yeah, there is a bunch of stuff that came up. <laughs> like, I'm always following different threads because I'm curious, and it's just like, or I'm just led. Um, and it's just part of my process of learning and growth and knowing who I am. And so there was, like, so many cool things, really, that have been coming up and that I've been, yeah, following. <clears throat> And like, uh, yeah, it's like the detective and the hunter <laughs> coming up. It's <laughs> just like, yeah, like I see like this or private detective with this like magnifying glass looking at like little clues and like this archaeologist, uh, yeah, digging and <laughs> brushing off the sand off these old bones and yeah, trying to make sense of <laughs> the past and all that, which is, yeah, really awesome and funny too like we're jigging up like some of the past shit and like trying to make sense of it or trying to figure out what to do with it in, in a lot of ways and um, I s began or I started my practice of descansos about maybe two months ago and that was a practice of laying the dead orphans of the psyche to rest and uh, that actually like was really powerful and potent and I procrastinated it for a little bit because I, I don't know, like, I just thought it was going to be like too much or too hard or it's going to, I don't know, like, there was some story about like <laughs> why, why I didn't have time, <laughs> like at that time to do it. And, um, but yeah, I just decided, okay, like it just kept coming back up, like, hey, hey, <laughs> this is for you, this is good for you. And so I was just like, oh, all right, well, I'll just like let go of the anchors that are keeping me from like showing up for you know to choose that and just like just get out of my own way you know and just chose it and just filled out a couple pages the first day it was good like, and then a couple days later went back to it did a couple more days and then a couple days later did a couple more pages and like yeah all of that it was so like oh it was like one of the best things like it was so healing for me like to actually acknowledge and to see like certain events and what the archetypal like theme or the wound behind it was like with abandonment rejection and betrayal and to see yeah how like those things like were old patterns or unfinished patterns that just kept playing itself out in order to find a resolve or to to reconcile or to be like dissolved um, and then the energy could form a new pattern with the new information <laughs> you know but yeah it was just a matter of choosing it and being willing like to lay the path to rest and so 
what came up yesterday was I got to give a friend a reading, um, a little mini reading. And then I had also, yeah, had wanted to practice like that for myself. And so I gave myself a reading too. So it was really super awesome that I got to choose that. And it just kind of, since I was open and willing to receive and to offer as well. And it just like came into being like super easily, like things just line up, you know, like once we put it out there, Hey, like, <laughs> will you help me learn this? Or, um, I want to experience this or I choose this or I invite this like, and it's like available and like being, you know, being manifested or like, uh, um, the opportunity to manifest it is available. So it's pretty cool. The invitation I was like, it's always there. The invitation to be ourselves, to be ourselves and show up for ourselves and to love ourselves and to care for ourselves. So however that looks like for you. And so, um, the hanged man, and this is the, in the reversed position, he came up in my friend's reading and in my reading. So, uh, I feel like that is like, it totally is, uh, where some of us are individually and collectively where we're unable or unwilling to let go of the past or break free from the past, break free and break open. And so like, it is like a period, a transition period. And it is like, yeah, feeling kind of like a little bit of stuckness, but knowing that it is moving and um, that it's okay, really, it really is. And yeah, and so we just get to hang upside down and hang out um, to turn it all around. So it's like, yeah, some of those messages that I'm getting too, and Turtle keeps coming up. So she's always a good reminder to slow down and be present and to allow the process and yeah not to hurry the process like there's no worries and no hurries just be here now you can be present and um be at home within yourself and trust what's now yeah and allow so yeah it's pretty pretty fun to be reminded of all of that and um yeah there's certain animal companions that are coming up around community and around um, excavation which is fun and um, attention so yeah all those things are coming up and so um yeah there's a lot of synchronicities and a lot of things that i've been following and linking yeah just organically and uh it's really awesome because i've been working with the addict right now and uh, the feral woman <laughs> yeah the feral woman the the woman who was once wild who became domesticated and yeah that's like another way to look at the addict in certain ways um <laughs> where she was wild and domesticated but she's still like she's a little bit <laughs> yeah a little bit wildish still but instinct injured and so yeah like kind of trying to reconcile like these two parts within me and I did rearrange my space a little bit um yeah just because it felt like god oh, I'm on a refresh and, and just kind of reorder a little bit and because I'm rewiring and rejoining like these parts of myself reunifying and synthesizing and integrating yeah all these parts of the whole and so just making peace with that like good girl and that wild child and they're one and the same really and uh, looking into like where I had that inner conflict within myself of wanting to be good and wanting to be acceptable and wanting to be loved but also wanting to do it my way and be true to me but still be worthy of belonging and like oh gosh that was just the most challenging thing to reconcile like how do i do that like remain true to myself and my own path and also like still be worthy of belonging and acceptance like, because there are so many things that just weren't allowed or were disallowed it was inconvenient or it was messy or it was loud or 
it disturbed someone else's sensibilities, you know? And he's just like, yeah, well, what are my responsibilities and what's mine and what's not, you know? Like, and like what kind of beliefs or standards of false perfection or worthiness have been flung upon us by our culture, by the, the cult of culture, by, by the cult of pop culture and like false culture, really, in a lot of ways. And so um, this little thing, this one page that I wrote this morning uh, relates to a lot of different things that I've been following and then we'll, and, uh, we'll see what happens with this continuity. But there is, <laughs> it's so cool, like, everything that is coming through and it's just like thank you for this play and this like experience and this game and this stage like to see it play out <laughs> to see it all play out and and play in it yeah so it's just <laughs> yeah the, the eyes of a child and that wonder and that awe and that enchantment and the magic yeah and sometimes bliss bunny highs and bliss but like that's not so much as important to me anymore like where I feel like I have done some good practices with regulating my emotions and working through difficult challenging emotions that it's not such a um, oh, such a I guess need to chase those highs as much as I used to and so like yeah it's and it just comes naturally in the joy so that's really cool. Like, we really love and enjoy and appreciate that. So, like, yeah, I love, loved working and choosing appreciation instead of focusing on lack. Yeah, and that is just like bringing more prosperity through and it's like being able to see because of the gratitude all of the gifts that are available rather than not like here or <laughs> You know, like, yeah, it's just a totally different lens to be through, like, to feel all the love through. <laughs> so, and it's more true and more full and more expansive and wider view. So, yeah, there's super cool synchronicities that align and go go along with that. So, here's so, oh, well, we just had our eclipse and uh, our full flower moon, total lunar eclipse portal. Yeah, so we're still in those energies right now. And yeah, it's it's been pretty potent. And it is like all about the light right now. Let there be light. <laughs> so, when, um, we'll just begin. Yeah, breathe, begin again. Like there's so much that wants to be shared. But I'll just ask yeah, that what would serve the highest good of the whole be shared and expressed. May 26th, 2021, we don't need to cut away anything or reject anything. We just get to invite what we need and let the rest be or fall away. The dismemberment and the bargain without knowing, the wandering, finding love in the underworld. The devil, the red dancing shoes, the feral woman, orphan child, the blind woman, the addict, the whore, and the prude. Instinct injured, crippled, captured, and controlled. The girl carried away by the red shoes, sneaking substitutions to feel pleasure, exhausted, depleted, drained, tortured soul, trying so hard to be good and proper, to be loved and found acceptable, denying her wild self, her instinctual self, the animal, the earthling, the angel, and the demon, the centaur, and the battle of the beasts, the arrow of Sagittarius, aims, goals, and truths, lower and higher natures, joining, rejoining, to unite, yoga. Heaven and earth, body and soul, heart and mind, mother, mother, father and child, thought and memory, Odin's messenger ravens. I can't remember if that was like Hagen and Magen or if it was something else. Like I'll have to go back and look at that. But that thought, thought and memory have been coming up as well. Um, and that is like, yeah, kind of what keeps us in the past or kind of um, projects us into the future and prevents us from being here now with what is. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting. Going to look at that a little more. So yeah, the raven keeps coming up. And I'm wearing a shirt today that has ravens on it. So, yeah, that's fun too. So it's all about magic and cooperation. Yeah, and 
intelligence. Yeah, like that irrational intelligence, divine intelligence, uh, cosmic intelligence. So attention and currency, attention spans and curiosity. So that's one thing um, that's come across lately too, is that like with all of the information that we're bombarded with daily, we're so overstimulated that I feel like we're addicted to that stimulation and sometimes that's why we have a hard time focusing and sitting still or getting grounded or slowing down is because we're so like yeah in that um energy of consumption and overstimulation that we don't realize sometimes how it's detrimental for us and how we get depleted and drained and exhausted and pretty much yeah we torture our own souls like living in or operating in those ways sometimes yeah so just kind of like, yeah, looking at those things. We'll see what else wants to come through about that. Yeah, our questions, answers, and inner knowing. Attachments, addictions, and letting go. Self-worth, self-love, self-truth, and self-care. Be aware, become aware. Open to receiving all the gifts here. Responsibilities and integrity. An indivisible whole, a unified whole. All parts of the whole relate to the whole and are interdependent and interchangeable. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. And with that said, yeah, that just like is everything that's been coming in like this week in my continuity and my streams. <laughs> yeah, tapping into like this information and this new relationship with energy consciously engaging with this creative energy yeah so it's a new way of being and a new way of operating in the world in the world but not of it so <clears throat> yeah it's kind of freaking interesting and fascinating and intriguing and so yeah this is what i'm led to share um this time so um one of my videos of last week at the tail end, I was sharing a dream, and for some reason, like, the audio got, like, really, really distorted, and I wanted to share this dream again, because, I, yeah, it, there was something in there for me that, yeah, to look at, and now I kind of see how it relates to what I was reading in um, Women Who Run With the Wolves, when sh she was talking about the the leg traps or self-preservation identifying leg traps so where we get captured yeah yeah in that feral state and so yeah i wanted to share this dream because it does relate in a lot of ways and this dream is from august 9th of 2019 and yeah it was kind of interesting so uh, yeah i listed first like the like the, the places like there was a club and then there, uh, there was a home and then it was family friends the lighting was strange like the things that stood out to me like the set and the setting and all of those things and like what kind of questions or themes were coming up how do people see me and then like yeah different characters in the play like sometimes they're characters that we know and sometimes they're characters that our psyche makes up or maybe like it's, it represents an archetype of some kind or yeah there's some kind of connection or story yeah um, through unseen parts of the mind sometimes and it's just really interesting to look at those things so, so I'm looking at like role-playing or pretending acting playing there's drugs there's a party there's like yeah altered states of consciousness I'm a hostess a goddess a priestess and a shaman or and a servant so caregiver healer martyr rebel maverick leader mother wife good girl mysterious femme fatale people pleaser matriarch goddess and stranger so sometimes yeah we are strangers to ourselves and the strangers in certain fairy tales actually represent like the devil in certain ways so we'll get into that in a little bit but yeah, colors and yeah, the colors in the dream, I guess, and the perceptions that I was receiving and the space and the place. So this dream is hazy, but I remember a few things. We're supposed to hang out with family and friends at a dance club or a bar. The new churches to worship, sell, exploit, and possess the goddess. 
and I don't really feel like going or being there. I mean, I love family and being with loved ones, but it doesn't really feel like my preference, like my kind of place. And I'm a bit repelled by the energy or the feeling of the place. And there's stuff going on behind the scenes in the foggy dim light of the shadows I'm not seeing for what it is. In this light, it seems like we're sitting at, a, at banquet tables, waiting for entertainment of some kind, and maybe some food and spirits, some, yeah, some alcohol, and uh, comedy for tired, dull minds and underdeveloped imaginations. The same old lines and formulas, bread and roses, distractions of all kinds, to keep us from seeing, claiming, receiving, following our own heart's truth and light. I feel like I can't really be seen very well here, feeling like an odd thumb, not very comfortable or at ease here. It doesn't feel very welcoming, open, safe, warm, or comforting. It feels a little edgy. So is this my comfort zone? <clears throat> being stretched or am, am I being asked to stretch my comfort zones so to go where I have I may feel uncomfortable like, yeah that's a tricky tricky thing yeah to use discernment because some some places we're repelled by them because like it's not a good match for us but sometimes it's like exactly what we need but we're in the most resistance to so it takes a little bit of discernment anyways like, yeah and it is good to pay attention to how we're feeling and to how you know to, to our gut instincts yeah because we we're, we've been taught to question those like, and second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth guess those our, our instincts and our inner knowing our intuition and our inner voice so there's that and so yeah um, there is like yeah something about being being uncomfortable so pay attention when I'm feeling open and vulnerable I mean it's not all dark and heavy here we really make it what it is so there is lightness and potential here for healing connecting integrating and meeting it seems like there may have been some kind of drugs or substances, some kind of psychedelics or stimulants that simulate bliss. It's not the real thing, but a fake, maybe treacherous kiss of death. I'm not really feeling it, and we decide to go home, and then we have a family dinner planned, and I'm excited to be in my element of home, hearth, solidity, truth, generosity, etc. But lol, I'm kind of obsessively preoccupied with how I'm presenting myself, like I want to be seen as the caregiver, domestic goddess, virgin, fertile maiden, full mother, wise woman, nurse, medicine woman, caregiver and sage, also the beautiful enchantress, mesmerizing all with my beauty, wiles and charm. Like they don't just come naturally. <laughs> why am I trying so hard to maintain an idealized image or why do I want so badly for others to fall in love with me or see me and be mesmerized, captivated, twitter pated, hypnotized? Is that my shadow enchantress or is that my narcissist or Adonis? And it's funny, it's like I'm worried about what other people think or or how they perceive me because I want their approval and admiration affection reception or for them to buy what I'm selling lol like Magellan so we're about ready to sit down for dinner at this gigantic family table it's rectangular with all sorts of fancy place settings it looks like a gourmet meal spread on the dishes china cloth napkins yeah all of the ambiance and the atmosphere and it looks really nice, polished, and refined, or maybe idealized. So, like, the set and the setting, like, is all there. Um, and the setup is nice, but, like, there is actually no nourishment like, there. The food hasn't arrived, or it doesn't seem to be there yet. So, and I'm, oh yeah, it looks like it's set up for a five-course meal. So, it's like this extravagance, like, where everything... Like all of the energy was put into how it looked and, and the appearance of it. When, and then there was no energy put into the actual substance and nourishment and like food like that was meant for support, you know? And I'm realizing too that I do have a lot of these dreams like with these dinners or family meals or yeah, like these last supper kind of things in a way sometimes like where there's this huge ass dirty table and that's like the stability you know like sometimes that I have uh, rebelled against like that stru structure and that rigidity in certain ways like yeah when it gets to be too dogmatic 
or uh, too polarized to the extreme. And also, like, that's what I always crave as well, was like that structure and stability, but like always repelled. So it was like that inner conflict as well. So that's kind of interesting to see. And also, yeah, another dream that I had read about um, that relates to this one as well, which was from last year. So one from 2019, one from 2020. So, um, yeah, it's set up for a five course meal, it's all fancy, and but the food doesn't seem to be there yet. So I'm willing my sister into the dining room to get her to her place. Why is she in a wheelchair? It seems like she's needing help or a hand with getting around and taking care of herself. But it almost seems like an old caregiver role that I had with, yeah, my friend that I took care of. And yeah, why does it just seems like it's that kind of a dynamic caregiver role? Is that what is keeping me from being true and full? I'm worried about how I am to fill this large role and how I how do I do it? How do I appear? Or how am I seen, perceived, received? And how do I feel about me? What a strange dream. LOL, I'm willing to see deeper into these things. And so there was. <clears throat> There's a little bit more. And then, uh, yeah, another sequence where I was actually painting. And um, this is around the time when I was working on a rainbow canvas with an ohm symbol in it. And, um, yeah, and then, so I was, that was incorporated into that dream as well, like receiving yeah, the light and certain colors. And that was enjoyable. It felt easy and right. And if I could just let it be all right, <laughs> being all, all that it is, yeah, it's all right. So it became, and so it can become all it is, and I can become all I am. I can be all I am. And yeah, there was a little bit more um, from that entry, but that was, yeah, the dream. And I may go back to that part in a later video because it goes along with cycles and the time, but the, the stuff that's coming up now for me this new relationship with time or this new relationship in time yeah with time so it's a little <laughs> nutty <laughs> but it makes sense to me um but yeah the dream from last year it was talking about like a stepford wives type of dream um like it was this map that uh, i was looking at and it was like all of these different lives or these half lived lives and these almost lived lives and these uh, substi substitute lives or these lives that we're t uh, told that we should have instead of, you know, the life that we want. Or, like, no, that's that life you don't not want. It's not going to be practical. It's not like acceptable. This is the life that you want. And this is the life that's, you know, that's available to you like over here. And it was, yeah, it was like had to do with all those things. Like, um, really, I, yeah, I'll probably go back into that and, and read it again, listen to it again. <laughs> but it does like go along with the, the same type of themes where it's like more about appearance rather than like what it actually is and like the true substance or the essence of the thing. And so it does go along like very well with what I was reading the other day and um, just thought I would let it percolate. I haven't looked at it um, since then, but I have like uh, contemplated a little bit about it and did end up writing just a little bit about um, some insights that I had. But yeah, I'm just going to go back to where my bookmark is here in Women Who Run With The Wolves and I just wanted to share like a little bit from this chapter. So, um, self-preservation identifying leg traps. And in the beginning of this chapter, it was, there was a story about um, an old, old tale called the Red Shoes, and it has gone by many names. And one of the names I think is the Red Dancing Shoes. And it's this little girl who is an orphan and uh, she is living in a little forest and she, you know, just searches the forest for sustenance and nourishment and food and to like to care for herself and she collects like little scraps of fabric where she can and she sews up her own little pair of shoes for herself and because like this came from like things that were available and given to her um, and she made them herself she constructed them herself she loves them so much and she's so proud of them 
and uh, they were like made out of like little red scraps of fabric and um, one day as she's like coming into town there's an old woman in a in a very nice um, yeah, extravagant carriage going by and uh, her coachman stops the carriage and she realizes that this little girl is all alone and so this this elderly lady is all alone as well and she decides right there on the spot well I'm gonna take you home and you're gonna be yeah I'm gonna take care of you and you'll never want for anything again yeah just come come and be with me child and so the old lady brings the, the little orphan girl home and gets her bathed and like cleaned up and all of that and actually th throws away her old rags and her old shoes that she loves and uh, she says, yeah you don't need me you don't you don't need those things anymore you, you have like better things now you know things that money can buy and yeah <laughs> you don't need junk or rags anymore and so like the, the girl's devastated that her like her only possession really that meant a lot to her that was sentimental um, yeah, has been discarded and devalued and like, yeah, just thrown out. <laughs> and, but um, yeah, she actually does like get a new wardrobe and everything and this woman actually takes her to the shoe store to get a brand new pair of shoes. And the woman actually, she doesn't have very good eyesight and she, yeah, she's kind of almost like pretty much blind. <laughs> and. Uh, the shoemaker at the store, um, yeah, is very like mischievous and kind of like gives her a little wink and like shares like little side glances with her, like unseen from like this this new guardian protector that's supposed to take care of this little child, but isn't like kind of really observing like certain things, or she's kind of missing certain things about like, yeah what's going on like beneath the surface or what really is <laughs> you know and so yeah the girl as she's trying on different shoes and stuff she sees this beautiful pair of fine leather shoes in this case in this display case and it was the most expensive pair of shoes in the store and they just are so shiny and so bright and that's what yeah the little girl decides on and since the old woman can't see and this, this, the, the shoe man, the shoemaker is like in on this little ruse, like with the girl and he gives her a little wink, you know, like my, our little secret. But the woman like actually ends up paying for them and she doesn't even know what she's paying for. <laughs> and so actually it is kind of like almost like a bargain without knowing. But uh, yeah, so it's interesting. But anyway, it's like with this, with the red shoes, um, there are like certain acceptable ways to wear them or, or certain um, places that are not acceptable to wear them and um, so like they go to church on Sunday and the little girl wants to wear her red shoes but it's like a pretty scandalous affair for her to wear her, those bright bright red shoes at church because it's gonna distract people and it takes away from like yeah what what the uh, programs there are and stuff and, like um, the, the old woman didn't realize until like all of these people come up and tell her oh your ward she's wearing those these ghastly or like just kind of maybe whorish red shoes you know and so she's the, the child is scolded and told never to wear those red shoes to church ever ever again and so like they're taken from her and like so there's this like new relationship in a way like I've got a I really that's what I really want those red shoes but like in a way kind of feeling guilty about it and so like having to sneak having to sneak certain things that we like kind of like help us feel like a pleasure kind of help us feel um, like we're wild again for a certain amount of time or yeah that we're free for a certain amount of time free from our like our drudgery or our like our our made-up lives you know, like our false idealized lives, um, it, like 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 an escape of some kind, yeah. So like it's like an addiction in a certain way. It's so when she puts on the shoes and she's not allowed to, like it feels really good because it's it feels like something sh that she wants to do that she hasn't been allowed to, and um, so it does like bring pleasure for a little while, and like she does like feel this like spring in her step and she wants to dance she wants to express herself 
And so like, yeah, she dances in those red shoes. And um, she just can't help it. She's got to wear them to church again the next day. And um, yeah, the next time we go to church, and she goes, she gets them down, she puts them on, the old woman can't see. And she just thinks, oh, I'll just, I'll be good and I won't let them distract me. But during the whole like church service, she just keeps tip tapping her feet and she just can't help but wanting to dance. There's this guy with a red beard there who's like the stranger. And he also like gives her a little wink because he, he knows like he knows what's going on too. Like, and so in a way it's like the devil, like who is the shoemaker and the stranger at church <laughs> who, and he gives her like, her feet like a little scratch and she has like this uncontrollable like itchy foot tap now <laughs> where she just got to move and dance and then she gets carried away by the pleasure of that like substitution or like that pleasure that she gets to sneak off um, and and feel good for a little while till she comes back and has to go along with all the programs and the conditioning or whatever. So it's like the escape for a little while and then going back like to the to the domestication or to like yeah, that that setting that's controlled in a way or that's structured in a rigid way. Yeah. But um yeah, so she does she gets in trouble again and scolded and uh, this time the woman the old woman puts them up really, really high up on a shelf so she can't reach them and never touch them ever, ever again. And so, but we know how that works. <laughs> Got to figure out and find out things for ourselves. Anyways, the girl actually does end up putting the shoes on one more time. And as soon as she puts them on, the shoes have a life of their own and they carry her away out the door, out of the house, out to the forest where she's dancing and dancing and contorting in different painful directions and all she wants to do is stop but she's unable to stop because the shoes won't come off of her feet like they're they're stuck on her feet now and so she begs the stranger to cut off her feet <laughs> yeah so that she can be freed from this torture that in this agony that she's been put through because she made a poor choice and she chose the substitution of her real wildish or instinctual life yeah, because she thought that was the only thing that was available to her, like that resembled like what she really wanted or what was really right for her. So yeah, so she ends up yeah, getting her feet chopped off and that's, <laughs> yeah, would be a gruesome fairy tale. Like, but it does, yeah, show a lot about the psyche and about like kind of how we compensate in certain ways for instinct injury, and like putting certain parts or hiding certain parts of ourselves away or discarding or rejecting those certain parts only to need a substitution or an escape <laughs> from like the prison that we've locked ourselves in or that we've agreed to in certain ways, that bargain without knowing. So yeah, I hope that this is a little coherent, hope it makes sense. And I'll just start where we're at, like in this, in the middle of this. So, um, yeah. trap number four: injury to basic instinct, the consequence of capture. So, oh, but I think before that, there's this. I my eye just got drawn to like this this paragraph here: the starving woman endures famine after famine. She may plan her escape, yet believe that the cost of fleeing is too high, that it will cost her too much libido, too much energy. She may be ill-prepared in other ways too, such as educationally, economically, spiritually. Unfortunately, the loss of treasure and the deep memory of famine may cause us to rationalize the excess. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, the loss of treasure and the deep memory of famine may cause us to rationalize that excesses are desirable. And it is, of course, such a relief and a pleasure to finally be able to enjoy sensation, any sensation. A woman newly free from famine just wants to enjoy life for a change. Her dulled perceptions after the emotional, rational, physical, spiritual, and financial boundaries required for survival endanger her instead. So a woman newly free from famine just wants to enjoy life for a change. Her dulled perceptions about the emotional, rational, 
physical, spiritual, and financial boundaries required for survival endanger her instead. For her, there is a pair of poisonous red shoes glowing out there somewhere. She will take them wherever she finds them. That is the trouble with famine. If something looks like it will fill the yearning, a woman will seize it, no questions asked. So number four, injury to basic instinct, the consequence of capture. Instinct is a difficult thing to define for its configurations are invisible. And though we sense they have been part of human nature since the beginning of time, no one knows quite where they might be housed neurologically or precisely how they act upon us. Psychologically, Jung speculated that instincts derived from the psychoid unconscious, that layer of psyche where biology and spirit might touch. I am a a considered same mind and would go further to venture that the creative instinct in particular is as much the lyrical language of the self as is the symbology of dreams. Etymologically, etymolo, etymol, <laughs> I know this word. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> etymology, I just can't say it. It's so funny right now. Hmm. So etymology and etymology, <laughs> etymologically <laughs> anyways <laughs> the word instinct derives from the latin <laughs> instigure with meaning impulse also instinctus meaning instigation to incite or impel via an innate prompting the idea of instinct can be valued positively as an inner something that when blended with forethought and consciousness guides humans to integral behavior a woman is born with all instinct intact so the idea of instinct can be valued positively as an inner something that when blended with forethought and consciousness guides humans to integral behavior. A woman is born with all instinct intact. Although we could say that the child in the tale has been swept into a new environment, one in which her roughness is smoothed down and her difficult life is removed, in reality her individuation ceases, her striving to develop stops. And when the old woman, a solifying presence, sees the work of the creative spirit as refuse rather than riches and burns the handmade red shoes, the child becomes more than silent. She becomes sad, which is the expected state when the creative spirit is locked away from natural soul life. Worse, the child's instinct to properly flee this plight is dulled to a nothing. Instead of aiming toward new life, she sits down in a psychic pool of glue. Lack of fleeing when it is absolutely warranted causes depression, another trap. So feeling stuck. <laughs> Lack of fleeing when it is absolutely warranted causes depression, another trap. Call the soul what you like, one's marriage to the wild, one's hope for the future, one's fluming energy, one's creative passion, my way, what I do, the beloved, the wild groom, the feather on the breath of God, whatever words or images you may have for this process in your life, it is that which has become captured. That is why the creative spirit of the psyche becomes so bereft. Through wildlife studies, of various species of captive animals, it was found that no matter how lovingly their zoo plazas are constructed, no matter how much their human keepers love them, as indeed they do, the creatures often become unable to breed, their appetites for food and rest becoming skewed, their vital behaviors dwindle to lethargy, sullenness, or untoward aggressiveness. Zoologists call this behavior in captives animal depression. Anytime a creature is caged, its natural cycles of sleep, mate selection, estrus, grooming, parenting, and so forth deteriorate. As the natural cycles are lost, emptiness follows. The emptiness is not full like the Buddhist concept of the sacred void, but rather empty like being inside a sealed box with no windows. So too, when a woman enters the household of the dry old woman, she experiences lack of resolve, miasma, simple depressions, and sudden anxiety states that are similar to the symptoms animals display when they have been stunned by capture and trauma. Too much do domestication breeds out strong and basic impulses to play, relate, cope, rove, commune, and so forth. When a woman agrees to become too well-bred, her instincts for these impulses drop down into the darkest unconscious, outside her automatic reach. She is said then to be instinct injured. What should come naturally comes not at all or after too much tugging, pulling, rationalizing, fighting with herself. When I speak of over domestication as capture, I do not refer to socialization, the process there whereby children are taught to behave in more or less civilized ways. Social development is critical and important. Without it, a woman cannot make her way in the world, but too much domestication is like forbidding the vital essence to dance. In its proper and healthy state, the wild self is not docile or vacuous. It is alert and responsive to any given moment or moment. 
to any given movement or moment. It is not locked into an absolute and repetitive pattern for any and all circumstances. It has creative choice. The instinct injured woman has no choice. She just stays stuck. There may be, or there are many ways to be stuck. The instinct injured woman usually gives herself away because she has had a difficult time asking for help or recognizing her own needs. Her natural instincts to fight or flee are dr drastically slowed or extincted. Recognition of the sensations of satiation, off taste, suspicion, caution, and the drive to love fully and freely are inhibited or exaggerated. Yeah, and that's like one thing that I was looking at and that has just come up. So like looking at where I've denied myself or disallowed myself certain things that really nourish me and nourish my creative soul and my wildness and like my wholeness, my fullness, my, and that like that creative, yeah, energy that is me, <laughs> so denying myself those things. And yeah, and in, in a lot of ways, in certain ways, like, even when it comes down yeah, like really rigid, rigid structures, like controlling, yeah, do to dominate and control, yeah, certain things. So. Recognition of the sensations, satiations, off-taste, suspicion, caution, and the drive to love fully and freely are inhibited or exaggerated. So as in the tale, one of the most insidious attacks on the wild self is to be directed to perform properly implying a reward will follow, if ever. So the reward and punishment system, the way that, oh, we can reward ourselves because we were good, we got through this little, this thing that we didn't want to do, or this little, yeah, it's just kind of funny, like the ways that we manipulate and manipulate others, like manipulate ourselves, and yeah. And like this bargaining with our ego, like, yeah, the bargain without knowing. So, as in the tale, <laughs> one of the most insidious attacks on the wild self is to be directed to perform properly, implying a reward will follow if ever. Though this, though this method, may I emphasize, may temporarily persuade a two-year-old to clean her room, no playing with toys until the bed is made, it will never, never work in a vital woman's life. While consistency, follow-through, and organization are all essential to implementing creative life, the old woman's injunction to be proper kills off any opportunity to expand. It is play, not properness, that is the central artery, the core, the brainstem of creative life. The impulse to play is an instinct. No play, no creative life. Be good, no creative life. Sit still, no creative life. Speak, think, act only demur demurely, little, little creative juice. Any group, society, institution, or organization that encourages women to revile the eccentric, to be suspicious of the new and unusual, to avoid the fervent, the vital, the innovative, to impersonalize the personal, is asking for a culture of dead women. And so, uh, I'll just skip to track number five, trying to sneak a secret life split in two. In this segment of the tale, the child is to be confirmed and is taken to the shoemaker for new shoes. The confirmation motif is a relatively modern addition to the story. Archetypally, it is likely that the red shoes is a many times overlaid fragment of a far older story or myth about the onset of Monarch, the onset of Monarch, and taking on of a mother, oh, and the taking on of a less mother protected life, a less mother protected life. A young woman having been taught awareness and response to the outer world by her own female elders in the previous years. It is said that in the matriarchal cultures of ancient India, Egypt, parts of Asia, and Turkey, which are believed to have influenced our concept of the feminine soul for thousands of miles in all directions, the bequeathing of henna and other red pigments to young girls so that they could stain their feet with it was a central feature in threshold rites. One of the most important threshold rites regarding first menstruation. This rite celebrated the crossing from childhood into the profound ability to bring forth life from one's own belly, to carry the attendant sexual power and all the peripheral womanly powers. The ceremony was concerned with red blood in all its stages, the uterine blood of menstruation, delivery of a child, miscarriage, all running downward toward the feet. As you can see, the original red shoes had many meanings. The reference to the Day of the Innocents is also a, la a later overlay. It refers to a Christian feast day that in Europe eventually eclipsed winter solstice celebrations from the old pagan world. 
During the older pagan celebrations, women practice ritual cleansing of the feminine body and the feminine soul spirit in preparation for figurative and literal new life in the coming spring. These rites might have included group grieving for childbearing loss, including the death of a child or miscarriage, stillbirth, abortion, and other important events in women's sexual and reproductive lives from the old year. Now in this tale, now in the tale occurs, now in the tale occurs one of the most revealing episodes of psychic repression. The child's voracious desire for soul ruptures the battens of her old dried out behaviors. At the shoemaker, she sneaks the strange red shoes past the old, past the old woman. A ravening hunger for the soul life has rushed to the surface of the psyche, taking whatever it can lay its hands on, for it knows it will soon be repressed again. This explosive psychological sneaking occurs when a woman suppresses large parts of self into the shadows of the psyche. In the view of analytical psychology, the repression of both negative and positive instincts, urges, and feelings into the unconscious causes them to inhibit a shadow realm. While the ego and superego attempt to continue to censor the shadows, the shadow impulses, the very pressure that repression causes is rather like a bubble in the sidewall of a tire. Eventually, as the tire revolves and heats up, the pressure behind the bubble intensifies, causing it to explode outward, releasing all of the inner content. And that reminds me of the samskaras that are put into deep storage into the heart, because that is actually like, was described in the untethered soul as a bubble. <laughs> yeah that when it's activated, it like opens like a flower. <laughs> yeah, and anyways, like, yeah, this is kind of interesting. So I'll read that one more time. This explosive psychological sneaking occurs when a woman suppresses large parts of the self into the shadows of the psyche. In the view of analytical psychology, the repression of both negative and positive instincts, urges and feelings into the unconscious causes them to inhibit a shadow realm. While the ego and superego attempt to continue to censor the shadow impulses, the very pressure that repression causes is rather like a bubble in the sidewall of a tire. Eventually, as the tire revolves and heats up, the pressure behind the bubble intensifies, causing it to explode outward, releasing all the inner content. And so, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like, when our samskaras, or those unfinished energy patterns, or those packets of energy get activated and trigger us, yeah, and then put us back into the past, um, in certain ways, yeah, there can be like kind of an explosion or an implosion. The shadow acts similarly. This, that is why a Scrooge-like person may amaze everyone and suddenly give millions of dollars to an orphan's home, or why a normally sweet person is capable of throwing a fit, temporary acting like a Roman candle gone berserk. We find that by opening the door to the shadow realm a little and letting out various elements a few at a time relating to them, finding use for them, negotiating, we can reduce being surprised by shadow sneak attacks and unexpected explosions. Though the values may change from culture to culture, thereby positing different negatives and positives in the shadow, typical impulses that are considered negative and therefore relegated to the shadowlands are those that encourage a person to steal, cheat, murder, act excessively in various ways, and so forth in that vein. The negative shadow aspects tend to be oddly exciting and yet entropic in nature, stilling balance and equanimity of mood and life from individuals, relationships, and larger groups. The shadow also, however, can contain the divine, the luscious, beautiful, and powerful aspects of personhood. For women especially, the shadow almost always contains very fine aspects of being that are forbidden or given little support by her culture. At the bottom of the well in the psyches of too many women lies the visionary creator, the astute truth teller, the far seer, the one who can speak well of herself without denigration, who can face herself without cringing, who works to perfect her craft. The positive impulses in shadow for women in our culture most often revolve around permission for the creation of a handmade life. These discarded, devalued, and unacceptable aspects of soul and self do not just lie there in the dark, but rather conspire about how and when they shall make a break for freedom. They burble down there in the unconscious, they seethe, they boil, till one day, no matter how well the lid over them is sealed, they explode outward and upward in an unchanneled torrent and with a will of their own. Then it is, as we say up in the backwoods, like trying to put ten pounds of mud back into a five-pound sack. What has erupted from shadow is hard to cap once it has been detonated. Though it would have been far better to have found an integral way to consciously live out one's joy in the creative spirit than to have buried it at all, sometimes a woman is pushed to the wall and this is the outcome. 
The shadow life occurs when writers, painters, dancers, mothers, seekers, mystics, students, or journey women stop writing, stop painting, dancing, mothering, looking, peering, learning, practicing. So that was like one thing that came up the other day too, is like reminded of a quote, I think it was Toni Morrison, maybe that said, <clears throat> or it was maybe it was attributed to her, but it is, yeah, an old, yeah, well-known thing. When um, a man or a woman used to go to a medicine woman, woman or man uh, with an illness or yeah, sickness or disease, they would ask them, when, when did you stop singing? When did you stop dancing? And when did you stop telling stories? <laughs> and so it's like this creative life, the creative life, this creative spirit, the, the soul life. So they might stop because whatever they had just spent long and long with did not come out the way they had hoped or did not receive the recognition it deserved or countless other reasons. When the maker stops for whatever reason, the energy that naturally flows to her is diverted underground where it surfaces whenever and wherever it can. Because a woman feels she cannot in daylight go full bore at whatever it is she wants, she begins to lead a strange double life, pretending one thing in daylight hours and acting another way when she gets a chance. When a woman pretends to press her life down into a nice, tidy little package, all she accomplishes is spring-loading all of her vital energy down into the shadow. Fine, I'm fine, such a woman says. And that was exactly like when I wasn't fine, but I didn't want to talk about it. That was my answer. I'm fine. Yeah, and so I did, uh, that was like my number one like answer when I was a teenager. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> I was anything but fine. Yeah. Yeah, so we know she is not fine. Then one day we hear she has taken up with a pic <laughs> piccolo player and has run off to tip, tip a canoe to be a pool hall queen. And we wonder what happened because we know she hates piccolo players and always wanted to live on Orcas Island. And she never before mentioned anything about pool halls. So, like Hedda Gabler in Henrik Ibsen's play, the wildish woman can pretend to live an ordinary life while gritting her teeth, but there is always a price to pay. Hedda sneaks a passionate and dangerous life, playing games with an ex-lover and with death. Outwardly, she pretends to be content wearing bonnets and listening to her dry husband cavil about his dusty life. A woman can be outwardly polite and even cynical, but inwardly hemorrhaging. Or like Janis Joplin, a woman can try to comply until she can't stand it any longer, and then her creative nature, corroded and sickened by being forced into the shadow, erupts violently to rebel against the tenets of breeding in reckless ways that disregard one's gift and one's very life. You can call it anything you like, but sneaking a life because the real one is not given room enough to thrive is hard on women's vitality. Captured and starved women sneak all kinds of things. They sneak unsanctioned books and music. They sneak friendships, sexual feeling, religious affiliation. They sneak furtive thinking, dreams of revolution. They sneak time away from their mates and families. They sneak a treasure into the house. They sneak their writing time, their thinking time, their soul time. They sneak a spirit into the bedroom, a poem before work. They sneak a skip or an embrace when no one's looking. To detour off this polarized path, a woman has to surrender the pretense. Sneaking a counterfeit soul life never works. It always blows out the sidewall when you're least expecting it. Then it's misery all around. It's better to get up, stand up, no matter how homemade your platform, and live the most you can, the best you can, and forgo the sneaking of counterfeits. Hold out for what has real meaning and health for you. In the tale, the child ducks the shoes past the old woman with failing eyesight. Here it is affirmed that the dry and perfectionistic value system itself is devoid of the ability to see closely, to be alert to what is going on all around. It is typical of the injured inner psyche and culture as well to not notice the personal distress of the self. So the young girl makes one more rotten choice in a long line of several. Let us surmise that her first step to entrapment Entering the gilded carriage was made out of ignorance. Let us say, letting go of her own handiwork was thoughtless but typical of those who are inexperienced at life. But now she wants those shoes in the shoemaker's case, and paradoxically that impulse toward new life is right and proper, but she has spent too much time at the old woman's and her instincts do not cry out in alarm as she chooses this deadly potential. In fact, the shoemaker conspires with the child. He winks and he smiles about her her poor choice, and together they sneak the red shoes by. 
Women trick themselves this way. They've thrown away the treasure, whatever it might be, but they're sneaking bits and pieces any way they can. Are they writing? Yes, but secretly, so they have no support and no feedback. The student, is she going for her edge? Yes, but secretly, so that she can have no help and no mentor. Is the performer risk risking putting out completely original work? Or is she presenting pale imitations so that she becomes a mime instead of exemplar? What about the ambitious woman who is pretending to not be ambitious, to be <laughs> pretending to be not ambitious, but who is heartfelt toward accomplishments for herself, her people, and her world? She is the powerful dreamer, yet consigns herself to struggle forward in silence. It is deadly to be without a confidant, without a guide, without even a tiny cheering section. So we all need our cheerleaders, and we can be those cheerleaders for ourselves as well. And yeah, I think we could. We could support ourselves and encourage each other and cheer each other on a little bit more. And I'm going to choose that for myself and for those that I love. For all that I love. It is, a difficult, it is difficult to sneak little shreds of life this way, but women do it every day. When a woman feels compelled to sneak life, she is in, she is in minimal subsistence mode. She sneaks life away from the hearing of them, whoever the them it is <laughs> in her life. She acts disinterested and calm on the surface, but whenever there is a crack of light, her starved self leaps out, runs for the nearest life form, lights up, kicks back, charges madly, dances herself silly, exhausts herself, then tries to creep back to the black cell before anyone notices she is gone. Like that line there like resonated deeply with me. <laughs> She acts distract, disinterested and calm on the surface, but whenever there is a crack of light, her starved self leaps out, runs for the nearest life form, lights up, kicks back, charges madly, dances herself silly, exhausts herself, and tries to creep back to the black cell before anyone notices she is gone. That's how I used to live life, like without even realizing it. Yeah, like for years and years and years, and I did feel like I was in a desert, like, yeah, starving in this famine. But then I found a little oasis within <laughs> Within, so. Women with poor marriages do this. Women made to feel inferior do this. Women filled with shame. Women fearing punishment, ridicule, or humiliation do this. Instinct injured women do this. Sneaking is good for a captured woman only if she sneaks the right thing, only if that thing leads her to liberation. In essence, sneaking good and filling in brave pieces of life causes the soul to be even more determined that the sneaking stop and that it be free to leave life out in the open as it sees fit. You see, there is something in the wild soul that will not let us subsist forever on piecemeal intake, because in actuality it is impossible for the woman who strives her consciousness to sneak little sniffs of good air and then be content with no more. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Because in actuality, it is impossible for the woman who strives for consciousness to sneak little sniffs of good air and then be, be content with no more. Remember when you were a child and you found out that you couldn't do yourself in by holding your breath? Though you might try to get by on just a little air or no air at all, some big fist bellows take over something fierce and demanding that makes you eventually shovel the air in as fast as you can you gulp it bite it down until you are breathing fully again blessedly there is something like that in the soul psyche as well it takes us over and forces us to take full breaths of good air truly we know that we cannot really subsist on sneaking little sips of life the wild force in a woman's soul demands that she have access to it all we can stay alert and take in the things that are right for us. The shoemaker in the tale foreshadows the old soldier who brings the dance yourself crazy shoes to life later in this story. There are too many coincidences between this character and what we know of ancient symbolism to think he is just an innocent bystander. The natural predator within the psyche and that of the culture as well is a shape changer, a force that is able to disguise itself just as traps, cages, and poison bait are disguised in order to lure the unaware. We must take into account that he makes a joke out of tricking the old woman. No, it is likely that he is in league with the soldier, who of course is a depiction of the devil in disguise. In olden times, the devil, the soldier, the shoemaker, the hunchback, and other images were used to portray the negative forces in both earth nature and human nature. So in olden times, the devil, the soldier, the shoemaker, the hunchback, and other images were used to portray the negative forces in both earth nature and human nature. 
While we could rightfully be proud of the soul brave enough to try to sneak a something or and anything under such drought conditions, the fact remains that alone, that that alone cannot be the sole issue. A whole psychology has to include not only body, mind, and spirit, but also equally culture and environ. And in this light, it must be asked at each level how it came to be that any individual woman feels she has to cringe, flinch, grovel, and plead for a life that is her own to begin with. Fuck yeah. Why in the hell do we think we have to plead and grovel and justify our lives? They're our own to begin with. Yeah. And in this light, it must be asked at each level how it came to be that any individual woman feels she has to cringe, flinch, grovel, and plead for a life that is her own to begin with. Like, why do we have to feel and why we have to apologize for ourselves for taking up space? What is in any culture that demands such? Inquiring into the pressures created by each layer of the inner and outer worlds will preclude a woman from thinking that sneaking the devil's shoes is in any way a constructive choice at all. And this trap number six, cringing before the collective shadow rebellion is next. And I think I will save that for next time. But yeah, this this one was like very like amazing for me like to read. And I didn't finish like the whole thing yet. I read like just a little bit more and uh, from where we're at and I haven't gone further than that yet but like I know like it opened up a whole lot for me and just like finding that story after reading reviewing some of my dreams that I was kind of led to go searching for is it's like really interesting because it is like the same kind of themes about like nourishment nourishing ourselves and like the appearance of things and like yeah that that instinct injuries and yeah making poor choices because yeah, that's what we think is available to us that can replace like what we really really needed or what our soul is really asking for so I just thought wow that's <laughs> there's some potency there like and there is like so much that parallels to what's going on now with the magic, uh, <laughs> the magic, whatever it is, <laughs> the magical, uh, we'll get back to normal program kind of a thing. Um, yeah. How that is actually a bargain without knowing like, and how it can deplete and drain us if we go along with certain things like that so that we can so we can belong or we can be seen as acceptable of belonging or worthy of belonging or inclusion and all of that so yeah this gives me a lot to chew on and digest and assimilate integrate and so there is um, a couple more things that uh, I wanted to share so um, I picked up my mythic astrology book and I was looking at Sagittarius because um, we just had our full moon in Sagittarius and you know, yeah that was interesting what it said about like the centaur and the arrow of Sagittarius and our aiming because that's coming up again like what are my aims <laughs> and what am I aiming for <laughs> and yeah so I thought that was kind of fun like to see to see that and it is like about the friendly fire too and uh, Sagittarius is a fire sign we're just in and also one other thing that came up um, I picked up this book that I bought like 20 years ago and I've never read it and it was like after I did my little yoga and meditation board, little art board, and I just like flipped it open. And there were some fun things that I found in there about thought and memory. I flipped right open to thought and memory, and then to another chapter about attention and concentration and how to develop it. Because a lot of us are so overstimulated, we don't. <laughs> yeah, sometimes our attention spans aren't that long. And I feel like I even read in my Art of Listening book that the average adult's attention span, like back in the, maybe it was even like the late 90s, 
was at 22 seconds. And so it makes me wonder, like 20 years later, what is it now? Like with like the technology and the addiction to social media and to um, the flood of information that's at our fingertips and like everything, all, all the, like the TikTok and the, yeah, everything that the internet, like that, that black hole vortex and get sucked into like, and it's like when we look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into us kind of a thing as well. And yeah, we just, a lot of the time we're unconscious of what, um, of everything that we are taking in in certain ways and how it drains us um, because of the overstimulation and um, how it can confuse us and cause inner conflicts and cognitive dissonance. Anyways, I wanted to share just a little bit about ooh, Sagittarius. Because Sagittarius keeps coming up, and the centaur, so the animal, he's the centaur is half human and half animal, and so I think that's really like interesting to look at, like that kind of an archetype. And Chiron, the wounded healer, yeah, it's all the healing that's taking place right now. Sagittarius. So Sagittarius is the last of the fire signs. It coincides with the increasing darkness of early winter. As the landscape becomes darker and the year moves toward its end, external activity is curtailed and the world of the imagination comes alive. The sign of Sagittarius is linked with the mythic centaur whose origins go back to Babylon and who is found in the figure of Chiron among the pantheon of the planetary gods. The centaur's duality is reflected in the contradictory nature of the sign for it possesses both the raw vigor and the power of the horse and the aspiring vision of the human spirit. The name Sagittarius comes from the Latin word for arrow, Sagitta. The, centers, the centaur's arrow flying towards some distant goal is an image of his quest for greater understanding, not only of his own mythic wound, but also of the universe in which the, guards, the gods are just. Through suffering and death are still part of the condition of all living things. Half beast and half divine, the centaur embodies the paradox of the human animal whose powerful and potentially destructive instincts are guided by hopes, ideals, and a worldview which recognizes the sanctity of life. In myth, centaurs could be rowdy and uncontrollable, especially when drunk. Yet the, ar the arrow of the Sagittarius is the heavens. Yet the arrow of Sagittarius in the heavens is aimed directly at the heart of Scorpio, thus suggesting that the centaur's enlightened vision can illuminate those darker human passions that lead us into blind destructiveness. So I'll just leave it there for now. And share just a little snippet. So from Vedantic Meditation, Lighting the Flame of Awareness by David Frawley. Memory, a burden we cling to, page 48. That was what I flipped it open to. Mm -hmm. The real possessions that bind us are our memories, our inner possessions. Memory is an attachment, a holding on to an experience, an accumulation in which energy is trapped. Memory is a form of matter, a substance in the mind. It is the residue of an experience that has left a mark within us. The degree of our attachment to the past, to a personal history, is the degree of our materialism. Our memories form the landscape of the world of illusion and sorrow, samsara, in which we are caught. This world of memory is revealed during dream and fantasy. It underlies our waking consciousness and distorts our perception. Hence, our fall into dream or fantasy is a fall into the inertia of our own minds. The more we are attached to the past and to a personal becoming in time, the heavier is the weight of our ignorance. That is why as we grow older, our life becomes more weary, more of a burden. It holds more memory that pulls us downward. We can easily measure our spiritual ignorance in life. It is equal to the density of our thoughts, our habitual stream of memory-based considerations. Similarly, the knowledge that we cling to th through thought is the measure of the matter in our minds that obstructs us from seeing the truth. So similarly, the knowledge that we cling to through thought is the measure of the matter in our minds that obstructs us from seeing the truth. We are not bound to the external world or to the matter outside of us. It is the world inside us, the matter within our own minds that binds us. Only when we take the world inside our, only when we take the world inside ourselves through thought does it become a burden and cause worry and anxiety. 
If we let the world be, it takes care of itself in the natural harmony and freedom of existence. Consciousness is immaterial and thought is matter. To fall into thought is to introduce a foreign substance matter into our unbounded consciousness and to weigh it down. Our thoughts are our matter through which we fall into the material world and its compulsions. To acquire things mentally through name recognition and identification is to add to the ignorance within us. The mind empties itself naturally, conscious itself, consciousness itself is emptiness, immateriality, and boundless space when we do not fill it with cares and anxieties. The realization that thought is a burden is the ending of thought. All worry and care is a useless weight that separates us from the beneficence, <laughs> the beneficence, the beneficence, beneficence of existence drawing upon us the very disharmonies that we wish to avoid. When we release the burden of thought through the perception of its foreign nature, we transcend the entire world. All worry and care is a useless weight that separates us from the beneficence of existence, drawing upon us the very disharmonies that we wish to avoid. When we release the burden of thought through the perception of its foreign nature, we transcend the entire world. And so that was my, like, that was my little, I guess, answer to my question. This is the mind empties itself naturally. And so, yeah, I, was, I wasn't very clear on what Yogi Bhajan was sharing in chapter three um, about, yeah, being wise. A wise man does not ask questions. A wise man knows. Yeah. And so it's just like letting that wisdom re emerge, letting the wisdom reveal itself to us or be revealed. Yeah. Or, yeah, just come through. And so it's like not doing, non-doing. So concentration and how to develop it. To transcend the mind and its many thoughts, we must be able to hold consistently to a single thought. We must have the power to fully apply our attention in a single direction without distraction. In our ordinary undeveloped state, our thoughts are fragmented and move in various ways that lose the energy of attention. Such a scattered mind can never arrive at any real understanding. First, we must learn to concentrate to sustain our minds on a particular inquiry. This requires that we have a real interest in finding the truth. It cannot be done as a mere curiosity or diversion. Yeah, we, have, we, we get to be willing to see the truth, but I feel like curiosity opens up so much, like just being led and um, being willing to play with stuff. Yeah, too. So. But yeah, I think we do need to be willing to see the truth as it is and not how we want it to be. Attention is like the muscle that must be developed by degrees. One can start by focusing on simple external objects like a candle flame or something attractive in the world of nature like the sky, a mountain, or a tree. Then we can proceed to internal objects, visualizing the form of a god, goddess, or teacher that communicates some higher reality to us. From internal images, we can move to concentration on a mantra or, an abs or abstract geometrical forms like yantras or mandalas. This eventually provides us with the ability to focus on deep inquiries like the question, who am I, which is the real goal. If we have a little concentration to begin with, we must develop it slowly and consistently in a step-by-step -step manner. Once we have mastery of concentration, by its power we can uncover all the secrets of the mind. Unfortunately, we are conditioned to carelessly give our attention away. This is the most of what we call entertainment, in which we give our awareness to another person or to some medium. We get fascinated with external personalities and dramas, failing to see that we are no longer in control of our own thoughts. Whatever we lose our attention to cannot raise us up in life, but only makes us asleep to the truth, more asleep to the truth. So whatever we lose our attention to cannot raise us up in life, but only makes us more asleep to the truth. Without one first possessing the power of concentration, meditation easily becomes an exercise in false imagination. When we try to meditate, we get lost in our unfocused thought current and its habits. To move through the mind just as to travel on the sea, we need the proper vehicle. Concentration is the boat that allows us to cross the confused sea of the unconscious. If we wish to really meditate, we must first learn the art of concentration and become capable of directing our attention at will. Yet to be able to concentrate is not easy and like any exercise requires initial work and struggle. We may prefer to simply meditate naturally, but without concentration, this may be wandering in our own distracted thoughts. <laughs> and so yeah, that's, that is funny. So I have been um, using images again and gazing again to 
help me uh, get out of that like <laughs> overthinking yeah and so that is really cool to see that the other day and also when I was doing some art boards um, when I was making my yoga board and some other boards that I made and I'll, I'll need to do a, another video to show you guys like some of those images um, yeah, when I have my new setup, I'll set up. <laughs> so I had found like this little thing from a book of symbols. And I, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what book it was because I, I used that book all up. Like that was one of the first books that <laughs> I freaking, yeah, used a couple years ago when I started my collaging and everything. But I, I kept like little things and I, I came across this the other day and it's all about sacred geometry. And I just want to share, like, yeah, how amazing this little nugget is. Sacred geometry. So certain geometrical shapes have the power to reach deep into the unconscious and affect subtle changes in the mood of the observer. This property is perhaps most apparent when applied by a skillful architect. For example, visitors to classic Greek sites such as the Parthenon often experience a sense of inner tranquility that can linger for days or even weeks. Similarly, the soaring grandeur of Europe's Gothic cathedrals resonates with some deep-seated potentiality within the observer and evokes a sense of boundless spiritual possibilities. The most direct explanation for the psychological power of abstract shapes is that they symbolize certain human emotions. An abrupt shape with irregular jagged edges for most people symbolizes anger or anxiety, while a symmetrical rounded shape represents feelings of relaxation and inner peace. It is possible that the near universal meanings of certain shapes reflect some pattern making ability within the mind itself. It is possible that the near universal meanings of certain shapes reflect some pattern making ability within the mind itself. There is firm evidence that some geometric forms are intimately more pleasing than others. Certainly babies are more strongly attracted to symmetrical harmonious shapes than to unbalanced uneven ones. This preference may have as its source the symmetry of the human face and the feelings of well-being and comfort associated with the parental face from an early age. Moreover, when a child looks at an inanimate object and begins to experience its own movements, it is profoundly aware of a sense of balance, and this awareness may with time become translated into visual terms. Our feelings about geometry may also be concerned with the intrinsic balance within nature itself, each state of mind counterweighted and in part defined by its opposite. This theme of balance is particularly evident in the symbolic meanings of the cross, perhaps the most widespread and ancient of all symbols. In many cultures, it represents the cosmos, the vertical line stands for the spiritual masculine principle, and the horizontal for the earthly feminine principle. The intersection is the point at which heaven and earth meet, and the result of their union is mankind, symbolized by the cross itself. So, I thought that was pretty amazing and awesome. And there are like more than I, there is like a lot more that I want to go into as well because there's just some really fun things that have been popping up to play. And um, I think I'll just share like one more little thing before I say goodbye for now. But um, yeah, I was looking at this board that I made because I had shared like the stories, the old untrue stories and my new true full stories like um, last week. And on the back of it, it was from um, a, a workshop or a circle that I had done a couple years ago. And I was um, introducing like the Jungian archetypes. And um, these are the self types. So, and they keep coming up this week. And I just thought it was so great, like that I kind of had a nudge to look at the other side and look. And it was just, oh my gosh, not even, <laughs> it's just not even like, He's so funny and it wasn't funny. Like, it was so funny. So the jester and the sage and the magician and the ruler. Yeah, the jester, the sage, the magician, and the ruler. So the self-types. And I have on here, like, the, the other names, like, also known as... The jester is also known as the fool, the trickster, the joker, the comedian, the clown, the wise man, the prankster, the pirate, the actor coyote or saboteur yeah 
And so there's like the core desire of this archetype, the core, the goal, the greatest fear, the weakness, the talent, the motto, and the strategy. So it was just kind of looking at all those and the sage. So like the sage, also known as the expert, the scholar, the detective, the academic, the teacher, the mentor, the thinker, the student, the fool, the know-it-all, the philosopher, the intellectual, the professor, the specialist, the seeker. Yeah, and just looking at like the motto, the motto of the sage is the truth will set you free. The strategy is seeking out information and knowledge, self-reflection and understanding thought processes and patterns. The core desire is to find the truth and yeah, knowledge, wisdom and experience to gain knowledge, wisdom and experience. The, the core goal is to use analysis and intelligence to understand the world. The greatest fear is being duped, misled, and ignorance being wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the weakness can study details forever and not act or practice and apply wisdom, integrate, like a failure to integrate. Yeah, that's a weak, that is a weakness. That can be a potential. So the talent is wisdom and intelligence and a desire to learn and understand. So I thought that was pretty great. And the magician, also known as the visionary, the catalyst, the leader, the shaman, the inventor, the sorcerer, the wizard, the mage, the witch, the priest, the priestess, the medicine man, the nature child, the initiate, the apprentice, and this, the servant master, the magical child. So the motto is, I make things happen. The strategy is to develop a vision and live by it. And the core desire, understanding the fundamental laws of the universe, the goal to make dreams true, to make dreams come true. Greatest fear, unintended negative consequences. The weakness is becoming manipulative or deceptive. And the talent is inspiring others and finding win-win solutions. So yeah, the ruler, the ruler. So also known as the boss, the leader, the aristocrat, the king, the queen, the politician, the role model, the manager, the master, and the tyrant. So it also could also be like a super ego there, you know? And the motto for the ruler is power isn't everything, it's the only thing. The strategy is exercise power and authority. The core desire is to control and power, control of operations. And the goal is to create a successful, prosperous family or community. The greatest fear is chaos and being overthrown. The weakness is being too authoritarian or unable to delegate. And the talent of the ruler is ambition, drive, commitment, responsibility, and leadership. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And I think maybe I'll do a, a review on the psyche and the archetypes next time as well. But I feel like that was kind of awesome and fun for now. And so thanks for listening. And Thanks for being here and thanks for being you and what's coming through for you right now. Like, are you like, what are, what are you aware of and, and how are you feeling and what's coming in for you and what's happening for you? All right. I hope you're well. Be well for yourself. Be true to yourself. Be well for yourself and be well. Talk to you, talk to you soon and bye for now.